spacecraft may one day be so common that everyone has flown on one, with thousands of new spaceships being built every year in manufactories dwarfing the enormous facilities we build planes and seagoing vessels in. Building a spaceship is an enormous undertaking. They tend to cost as much as an aircraft carrier, even though the crew and cargo are in a space about the size of a small boat or modest yacht. They require precision manufacturing unlike any other vehicle, and yet, one day their manufacture might be as routine as that of an automobile. Emphasis on routine, not simple, as there's nothing simple about the modern car, and I would not expect that to be true of personal spaceships either. But in many ways a spaceship can be simpler than a terrestrial vehicle. Space is mostly empty, with few obstacles or shifts to the road surface or air density to require constant course corrections. Today we'll be examining a lot of the different paths for the future of building ships, and we'll be looking at everything from simple asteroid mining ships produced in a low-tech future to cases where all the real work was done on the software and design end and someone just spills some self-replicator robots on a spare asteroid and they replicate and spawn ships out of it, or maybe even grow them quasi-biologically. And as we'll see, even in these high-tech situations, there are limits to how fast you can produce a fleet. Fundamentally, scale is what we're looking at today though, not building just one ship or a prototype but the mass manufacture of them, starship factories or dockyards. When I was a young teen there was a cartoon called Exo Squad that is a bit of a hidden gem, It often had deep realistic and philosophical discussions buried among second-rate animation and comic action scenes, but I liked it and it features humanity at war, and the good guys forced back to Jupiter at the start of the second season, where they're repairing and rebuilding their fleet. They lost the flagship in the close of the first season, and its successor was sabotaged and blown up while halfway built at their shipyard. That made me wonder how the heck they ever found the resources to build a ship when the bad guys had the three real planets, Earth, Venus, and Mars under their thumb, and were never told that any of the others are seriously inhabited. Those ships were huge, and they showed people in spacesuits going EVA to weld them. Automation of course can be a huge game changer in how these things work, but if you think about the newest aircraft carrier we built, the Gerald Ford, that came in at around 13 billion dollars. And if to keep the math easy, we assumed everyone in that building process and supply chain averaged $26 an hour in pay and compensation, that would imply a half billion man hours went to that construction, most of that occurring off-site, mining and making materials and paying the people who did that or made their equipment. But half a billion is a huge number, and even the annual version of that, assuming 2,000 work hours a year, is still a quarter of a million years of labor. It is important to understand that to build in space, almost all the material needs to be up there for it to be economically plausible, and while a lot of the cost might be in hyper-expensive tiny microchips or resource development and prototyping down on the ground, you are building that ship in space, and also mining, refining, and smelting all the metal for it there too. It's not hard to imagine needing a million people in space in terms of workers and families to build one big spaceship especially those mile-long ones popular in sci-fi, even with a lot of automation that still seems plausible. But I thought we'd begin in an era when there are still less than a million people living in space and look at a pair of fictional shipyards, the George Mueller Orbital Shipyard around Earth, affectionately known as Port George, and the Linus Collection Point orbiting 22 Calliope in the asteroid belt, affectionately known as the Scrapyard. Port George is named in honor of the father of the space shuttle and handles a number of different designs but is best known for its tender vessels, medium-sized ships with a crew of 6 to 12 designed for multi-week operation anywhere in cislunar space out to the Earth-Sun Lagrange L1 point. It is designed to be able to rendezvous with existing space structures or satellites and either to bring them inside, for smaller ones, or go EVA for larger ones. Port George itself has relatively minimal EVA involved in construction, it is a huge and mostly hollow facility, and even its areas exposed to the vacuum of space are typically still enclosed, just depressurized, 
to help protect the crew and vehicle under construction. Many of the ships they build are principally made of aluminum mined from Luna, and so there is little concern of oxidation damage to the outside. Even for those ships which are more sensitive to oxygen, it is usually considered safer and easier to have a thin wall pressure chamber for the dockyard workers to operate in. Indeed much of Port George is under low speed rotation to permit about a fifth of Earth normal gravity, as it was determined that a standard Earth atmosphere was needed but that workers mostly benefited from just enough gravity to feel like there was an up and a down. Personal living quarters generally are kept at 80-100% to of standard gravity. One of the more interesting things about Port George is that a large portion of its workers live down on Earth, and it would not be unusual for a work crew to consist of one or two humans and a dozen robots being controlled by telepresence operators down on Earth. After all, the time delay from Earth's surface to orbit is much less than a second, so although the latency is something that takes time getting used to and may require some anti-nausea medication, it's far from a deal breaker. After some trial and error, it was determined that keeping those same operators with those same on-site teams tended to result in far better group cohesion and quality control, so many an on-site dockyard worker has workmates down on Earth they are close enough with to occasionally visit whenever they are on shore leave. For very big ships such as an Aldrin Cycler, Port George used to do exterior, unshielded assembly of main components, but is now using inflatable bubbles of thin-walled, radiation-absorbent material to allow crews to use a relatively low-mass spacesuit with their helmet mag-locked to their thigh for if there's a pressure drop. This is seen as an overall safer work environment due to the physical exhaustion and psychological issues of bulkier suits designed for extended open space or void work as it's called. The more recent efforts to systematize space debris clearance have also made such large inflatable bubbles more long-lived, though punctures remain common and are typically treated with a quick patch till the entire bubble degrades, or the project is complete and can be recycled. Along with being able to rely on Earth for remote workers, Port George gets a lot of state funding and has critical but small components manufactured down on Earth. Nonetheless, it still has to be frugal about all its resources, especially those coming up from Earth, which is why salvage and recycling are critical to their operations. Port George is also known for its construction of the DS-12 Toy Box, a space debris collection ship with minimal bells and whistles, designed to allow a one or two person crew to salvage damaged orbitals and control a number of drones that are able to collect pieces of scrap with low delta V relative to the ship. The nickname of Toy Box officially is for all the neat drones the ship comes equipped with, but everyone knows it's for all the weird and unique garbage they collect. While the DS-12 Toy Box is viewed with a certain amount of amused contempt as a junker among other orbital spaceship crews, the handful of them that have been transported to the asteroid belt are practically considered luxury yachts. The growing space industry is hungry for metal but specifically for the cheapest metal, and that's where the scrapyard comes in. 22 Calliope, at over 100 miles across in most directions, is the second largest metallic asteroid in the belt, and something of a rubble pile including hydrated mineral and silicates, and it is home to a handful of mining operations, but Calliope is better known for having its own moon, Linus, which itself is 20 miles across and thus is bigger than both of Mars' moons combined. The scrapyard formed not long after somebody had the idea to run a skyhook-style tether directly between Calliope and Linus, hanging just over Calliope's surface which has a 4-hour rotation rate. Linus orbits it twice a week a thousand kilometers from Calliope, and which with good timing can be used to allow ships or cargo pods to accelerate and release around the belt or even back to Earth. This has made it a popular port of call of asteroid miners, which the census say now number 30,000 throughout the system, roughly 10,000 of which are in single or two-person crewed, owner-operator mining and prospecting ships, several hundred of which visit this asteroid pair for discounted rates of shipping cargo both to and from Earth. Many of those ships were built at the scrapyard on Linus, and here we see the art of minimalist shipbuilding not seen since the old days of early spaceship travel and many of which would be illegal to operate near Earth for a variety of reasons, ranging from worker safety hazards to some using radioactive materials. Ultimately, every dollar spent on a ship or its crew has to be paid for with the metals it mines, so the scrapyard allows lone individuals or small teams to be competitive with the larger and better equipped markets, 
at the price of taking some additional risks and enduring more discomforts. Fundamentally a spaceship is just a pressurized box with an engine, and the scrapyard understands this all too well. Their ships aren't for landing on big planets or taking off through atmospheres, they don't need the radiation shielding the DS-12 has because they're about three times further from the Sun than Earth, and thus only get 12% of the radiation from the Sun. And there's no Van Allen radiation belt out in the asteroid belt, and also no government inspectors pushing for worker safety. This far out from the Sun and orbiting it and not Earth, the majority of space debris is traveling relatively slowly, so it is possible to armor ships against it, and uranium is reasonably plentiful out in the belt as is thorium. Solar power isn't a very realistic option here, it can be done by using large thin reflective dishes to concentrate sunlight, but that's less viable while moving around. And the preferred method for mining and prospecting is to park your ship in a deep crater to protect it from micrometeors and other debris, but where it won't get a lot of sunlight. So the scrapyard tends to make a lot of ships that are very like the cargo pods they shoot back to Earth. Brutally simple. Those ships are often only two rooms, a main room for living, walking and sleeping, and a smaller airlock room for exiting, which often does double duty as a bathroom. They've got robots who make the big metal plates and the rest they slap together, and a lone person can easily move a multi-ton plate in microgravity. It is a slow process of shoving inertial mass around, but there's just the air holding it back. That's one of the neat things about a zero-gravity shipyard, you don't see many forklifts and large items are often slowly moved into place with a protective coating of inflatable air pillows on the side to minimize collision damage during installation. Sometimes one will get punctured and cause a fairly heavy object, like a nuclear-powered module, to start drifting and spinning around. There are surprisingly few injuries in the shipyards, but at least one was someone having a heart attack at the site of a nuclear reactor careening around the dock. They can make a ship in just a few days because they are not large or complex, weld the hull together, get an airlock and engine port on it, a window, usually on the opposite side of the airlock, so you can escape if one side is blocked for some reason. If your ship burns something out on an asteroid crater, it can cause a venting of gas that could knock it over and then, zero gravity or not, it could get stuck and wedged in, airlock side down. The very simplest ships just have a RTG and a device that can run metallicis on ore and produce metal plus oxygen, and they use that oxygen as their propellant when they're ready to leave, usually buying methane for fuel back at the depot, shipped in from Titan, which buys pressurized pods from Calliope. These ships have nothing like the efficiency of the bigger and more expensive fission reactor versions, running on more elaborate ion drives, but they are cheap and you can make one on your own, often by scrounging parts from many of the wrecked and discarded bits awaiting salvage or disposal on Linus, whose escape velocity of about 20 meters per second or 45 miles per hour makes it just sufficient enough to comfortably hold down cargo or salvage, as well as the crew, who might get flung off something or some loose debris may collide into and cause an air tank to leak. One of those issues with EVA for an asteroid miner or dockyard worker is that if you forget to tether yourself or any gear, it's generally going to get lost. Fetching drones are very popular but not cheap. Calliope has an annual festival which is held every five Earth years, as Calliope's orbit around the Sun is five Earth years, and has many contests one of which is who can untangle tool tethers fastest while in a full EVA suit, and the current champion, four times running, is the current elected mayor of the Binary Asteroid Group. She ran on untangling complex regulations for shipping back to Earth. Other contests include sealing a leaky compartment, finding a leak on a wall covered in consoles, and various feats of dexterity and acrobatics in microgravity while wearing a spacesuit. This episode isn't about the lives of asteroid miners or shipyard workers, but the folks at the scrapyard show us a future in which you could have a thriving shipbuilding and asteroid mining economy a billion kilometers from Earth, and yet needing only modern technology and automation. Let's consider the other extremes of that, like ultra-automation and self-growing ships, and begin by considering the nanotech self-replicator option. We tend to have this assumption that we can make tiny little machines that can make copies of themselves and perform some other task, general or specialized, 
and we assume if something the size of a biological cell can do this, we should be able to make something as good or better, and about the same size or smaller. Such being the case, one designed to live in a vacuum and take apart local regolith seems plausible enough, and they could have their own equivalent of DNA, and an extra separate one for the processes or items they were supposed to make. Like turn on, make a copy of itself, build one of Object A, make another copy of itself, build another Object A, etc. This would be a specialized version, and Object A might be a specific object, like a chunk of metal plate, or a paperclip, or maybe even a whole spaceship. Now this is popular in sci-fi, as are the nanobots running wild as grey goo, or a hegemonizing swarm. However, in practice we would borrow further from nature by having layers of ecosystems, and then further depart from nature by not feeling obliged to have an organism replicate itself specifically. So instead of having one species of self-replicator, you would probably instead have a few hundred, or million, each designed for some specific tasks, and built along different lines and scales. This one seeks metal deposits, this one builds kilns for melting metal, this one makes the rivets for use in airlocks, this one makes wire, this one makes killer drones that seek out any faulty or mutant bots and kills them. And none of them self-replicate. Rather, some big drone arrives and builds ten smaller drones, meant for building each of ten other smaller drones, who each have a specific model of yet smaller drone that they make. And you probably have some control variable the machines can't make or get that limits reproduction. This might be some specific rare element, or some manufactured black box widget some of the bigger replicators need, or even something akin to Bitcoin. One of the replicating layers has to mine codes before reproducing, and this limits its reproduction once it begins getting in excess of the estimated number needed for the project. So your replicator arrives at a spare asteroid and turns itself into a ship, or ships, and this is simple enough conceptually, but its sheer simplicity tends to make folks assume it's the end of all normal manufacturing. In practice, this is not an insta-ship. Even if your drones have a magical infinite power supply, they can only work so fast without overheating themselves and their surroundings till they get melted by their own frenetic walk. Also they break very easily and the sturdier you make them, the more replication time they need and the more energy per task they need. We talked about this more in our self-replicating space probes and Santa Claus machine episodes, and there are a lot of limitations in how fast you can do 3D printing, nanotech, or Star Trek style replicators. Odds are there are more problems we don't even know of yet. The clanking self-replicator is often a better option, and this is more the assumption that you're not going for tiny little robots, but a bunch of big drones and factories. Big animals and plants, not microbes. At its core, imagine a factory for making robots that could make any of the robots needed to perform most of the functions in that factory, to supply that factory, or build another copy of that factory. This is going to use a huge, insulated cauldron for making its metals because this is more efficient than a bunch of tiny bots. We don't really use these on Earth though because it's so much easier to employ a human for any of the parts that aren't easily roboticized or repetitive, and we have a lot of humans who need work. It's hard to predict how labor will go on Earth, where we have a plentiful supply of people, and there is good reason to think those people actually require more effort and resources if you do not keep them occupied usefully, so we will likely never have totally automated factories, but in space we may have to, especially with interstellar efforts. More likely though, we would engage in human-machine teaming, which at least in recent decades has tended to prove far more useful than machines alone or humans alone. So our spaceship factories in space, where manpower is likely to be limited, will probably tend to be in this semi-autonomous clanking self-replicator situation where some large but not truly automated chunk of the supply chain is being partially run by humans. Maybe maintenance, maybe they are the only ones doing final assembly and quality control, and the overall administration management might be jobs for them too. This would seem to work better for very big projects like those mile-long battleships sci-fi loves, or those even bigger arc ship colony vessels we love to discuss on this show for interstellar generation ships. This strikes me as your most likely setup in part because it resembles modern manufacturing, but is likely to have a lot of very simplified supply chains in locations if not steps. 
you are always able to move faster and better in manufacturing if you're dedicating a specific spot to making a specific item, not the whole device. For us, it isn't the lone bot or factory that self-replicates, or even the lone human or couple, but rather the civilization itself that self-replicates. And that's very needed where an arc ship is considered, because you're not just building a big metal cylinder, you have to set up and decorate or equip each compartment, some which need to be elaborate ecosystems for organisms you're taking with you, others would need complex factories for gear you need to repair and replace, and yet more would be schools, parks, farms, gardens, and entire communities. So we can't imagine tiny little robots or entire automated facilities doing this, maybe even building critters and people from DNA templates and education and care archives, but there are so many hurdles in the way of this process, what we call seed ships or data ships, that it would seem hard for it to go fast. Indeed when you think about it, while we can repair things hyperfast NASCAR style, or build houses or bridges overnight, generally speaking we tend to move bigger things, and more slowly than in prior times. Houses don't get built overnight or in a few weeks, it's a process of many months or even years for bigger buildings, and it produces superior work, at least for whatever quantities you're optimizing around, be it time, labor, money, minimal local disruption, etc. I think this will be the case more in the future too, but in the context of this larger organism doing replication, we might consider mitosis as an option. That our starship factories of the future might be starships themselves. We have contemplated this in the case of our gardener ships, a large interstellar generation ship that needs to be able to manufacture any component the ship or colony will need in case it breaks, since in multi-decade or multi-century journeys, anything can break. Thus they can manufacture an entire new ship so long as they're given the time and enough raw materials, and they have a lot of time, they have decades between nearest points in which to do little but build and breed more people. So arriving at a colony destination, it would seem very likely that many of the people who spent their whole life on that giant ship wouldn't necessarily want to become a planetary colonist, and the population would have risen during that voyage, so some stay on the old ship, some go to form the new colony, and some go on the new ship to a new destination after they help the colony start up and refill their raw supplies. They just keep doing this, growing their numbers and restocking as they journey toward the Galactic Rim, see our Guarding the Galaxy episode for a look at that life. But critically, it offers us the option of mitosis for ships, or colonial fleets, as they might be a small fleet rather than a lone ship, and might add ships as they go, building them from raw materials acquired at each stop, and occasionally divide that fleet like a cell would. Or a spaceship might flat out grow longer over time like a big long worm, then unlike actual worms, those type of ships could divide and form new ships by cutting themselves in half. Or they might even grow themselves in a DNA helix style and unzip the ship into two identical ones. We'll be exploring more of the ideas of truly complicated mass manufacturing and dedicating entire large asteroids to industry, or entire moons or planets, this weekend in our Sci-Fi Sunday episode, Forge Worlds and Industrial Planets. But as we're seeing today, it's very likely that your true starship factories, those making big ships, along the lines of colony vessels, not merely shuttles, are more likely to be the entire cities or nation-states in space, not some small dockyard of hundreds and in the future, a project of that scope might even be accomplished largely by automation. We are also seeing this automation is likely to involve many layers, from the classic welder to the entire biosystems of nanotech, to gardeners and biologists, and even more obscure things like hospital administrators, investors and recruiters, because those big ships aren't just a gun and an engine, they're a small civilization, or even a large one, and you need experts in everything and storage space for everything, up to and potentially including antimatter fuel or weapon storage, or space for the guys who handle installing the micro black hole in the spaceship's basement. Indeed you might need a whole war to really do it right, especially for big ones, and it might be that you do build them down on the ground, then winch them up into space by tether between a pair of orbital rings, but again we'll examine that option this weekend in Forge Wards. One last option for acquiring your spaceships is not to manufacture them, but to instead steal them from others, 
and space piracy might be a fairly complex process, especially as it's often likely to be data and designs you need to steal, not just raw materials or ultra-expensive computer chips. However, it is always possible we might be able to make ships that could travel to other universes if the multiverse idea is true, in which case you might be able to make your starships by manufacturing one, then stealing copies from those adjoining multiverses where an almost identical spaceship just got produced. Of course, that implies you're violating the first rule of warfare, never try picking on someone your own size, since they presumably have identical technology and infrastructure to yourself. It is also a good reminder about scale, because while those massive mile-long ships might be popular in sci-fi for their sheer appearance and immensity, we have good reason to believe that bigger will be better for a lot of aspects of ship efficiency, speed, or combat prowess, and that spacefaring civilizations can get away with both quantity and quality, fielding huge numbers of huge ships which are each incredibly sophisticated, multipurpose capable, and powerful. And so while we might see small ship factories like the Scrapyard turning out tiny boats, or others making small personal yachts, like we discussed in Your Own Personal Spaceship, there is definitely room for bigger starship factories, and they might need that room too, as some might be as big as entire continents, or encircle entire planets. I always enjoy writing these episodes with the narrative formats to them as it seems like stories are just such a good approach to teaching science. If you've done much STEM teaching you probably know how hard it is to teach some concepts, like electricity and circuits, to even smart adults or teens. It takes a unique mixture of hands-on experience and narrative to really make it stick. This is why I was fascinated by our newest sponsor, Upper Story. Their newest game, Spintronics, has a number of example puzzles for you to build woven inside a beautifully illustrated graphic novel. So instead of boring instructions you get a steampunk themed story of a young clockmaster learning an alternative technology, electricity, and using gears to build mechanical circuits and teach about both them and electricity. Spintronics does an amazing job showing all the electronic components in a hands-on way that is fun and instructive. I loved it and found it quite stimulating, but more importantly my kids loved it, everything from experimenting with different resistor combinations to building chain linkage, and I had to use ice cream to lure them away. So as we go into the holiday season, if you're looking for a fun and hands-on educational gift for your family or friends, something that can be played in a group or solo, use the link in the episode description, upperstory.com slash to learn more. And don't forget to use coupon code IsaacArthur at checkout to save 10% on your order. So back in August we began circulating a petition to save the New Horizons space probe out in the Kuiper Belt to keep the resource team for the billion dollar probe billions of miles from home running, and I'm very glad to say that was a success. We got thousands of signatures and the bulk of them, especially the early ones so critical to getting it to snowball, came from this audience. As did the donations that helped promote the petition for others to see, so if you signed that petition, shared it, donated to it, or wrote your congressman, yes, you absolutely saved the New Horizons probe so it could continue the process of expanding our horizons. Thank you so much, we literally could not have done this without you. I did also want to thank the rest of the leadership at the National Space Society for their support for this, particularly Executive Vice President Hoyt Davidson who did so much of the heavy lifting on the front end of this, and the Beyond Earth Institute and Space Frontier Foundation for co-signing our letter to NASA and Congress, along with many other groups like Space.com and Universe Today who helped to raise awareness or circulate the petition once we got it going and just helps show what amazing things we can do when working together for a shared, greater future. So again, on behalf of the National Space Society, thank you and Ad Astra. Speaking of building the future, this weekend on Sci-Fi Sunday we'll be continuing our factory theme by contemplating entire planets devoted to industry in Forge Wards and Industrial Planets. Then next Thursday on October 19th we'll discuss if life extension is ethical. Then we'll look at another type of dedicated planet, Fortress Worlds, on October 26th, and two weeks we'll finish October with our monthly livestream Q&A on the 29th. 
Then on November 2nd, we'll ask if the Rebel Space Colonies we often contemplate in sci-fi and futurism might occur and what they'll be like, before we release our big, three-hour long, updated and extended edition of the Fermi Paradox Compendium on November 9th. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate some help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week.